don't lose, at least if you follow good centrifuge practices. So today here's a practical guide on using laboratory centrifuges, both the normal kind and the ultra kind. So ultra centrifuges, which goes super fast. When we're dealing with centrifuges, we can see a lot of different sizes and different tube types and different like angles and rotors. The rotors like the thing that holds your tubes and that's going to actually do the spinning. When it comes to these rotors, there's two main types. There's these fixed angle rotors, which are going to hold the tubes at a fixed angle. These are often, often these angles are somewhere between like 28 and 40 degrees. They also have ones that are held at like a vertical angle or almost vertical angle. Then we have swinging bucket centrifuges. These are kind of like those jellyfish rides at an amusement park where they're going to swing out to the horizontal. Um, and we have these in a variety of sizes. And for both of these, we have options for both the normal centrifuge as well as for the ultra centrifuge. And so the ultra centrifuge is going to go really, really fast. And it's good for when we need to separate things that are similar, um, similar in size or get a better separation. We also have differences in centrifuge sizes. You probably noticed in some of these pictures, we have everything from these little mini uh, micro centrifuge um, tubes. So those little Eppendorf tubes to things that these bench top models um, would sit on the bench top. Typically, we use these for volumes like 15 mil, 50 mil conicals, things like that. And then we have the bigger centrifuges, which these floor model centrifuges, they sit on the ground. And there's different adapters and things, but these can go and these are really useful when we're like harvesting cells. We can do things like spin down a liter's worth of um, a liter's worth of cell culture. Where's that picture? Yeah, so you can help spin down like a liter's worth of cell culture. And there are different adapters that we can use to stick in different tubes. Um, so you can do like 50 mils, you can do 15 mils, you can do like 250. You just need different adapters and we'll get more into adapters in a minute. So some of these, the entire like thing, this whole thing comes out. So if you see like this in the center, there's this, what are the words for those? Like the hex wrench. Um, and so you can take this out and put in new rotors, such as like plate ones. Other times, or additionally, they have buckets that you can take the inserts in and out of. Um, so for example, you can put in the 15 mil tubes or you can put in the 50 mil tubes, and things like that. With these, these, bu these whole buckets actually come out, not just the inserts. When you have a centrifuge with buckets that come in and out, either it's like this or one of the um, swimming buckets like this, you always have to have the, all the buckets in there, even if you don't have all of the tubes in there. Um, so you don't have to have tubes in here and you don't have to have um, tubes in these, but you do have to have those buckets there, um, even if they're empty, that's just a little technical note. Um, and then we can also differentiate between what we're actually using the centrifuge for. So often what we're doing is just pelleting, so like sedimentation, where we have things that are very different in their mass their density, and we're going to kind of just do a bulk separation. So anything that's really, really big or, and it, or insoluble is going to pellet out. And then the stuff that's still soluble and that's smaller is going to be in this um, liquid portion. We call this liquid portion that's above this pellet, the supernatant. So this would be like the supernatant and this would be the pellet. Okay, and your pellet's position is going to depend on the tube angle. So in a fixed angle, it's going to be like on the upper corner of the tube. And then in the swinging bucket, it's going to be at the very bottom of the tube um, because your tube is swinging all the way out. So that's the pelleting. Um, we can also do like a gradient centrifugation. And this is good if you're trying to separate things that are more similar in size or density. Um, and you basically send them traveling through a gradient that is going to vary in its like density or viscosity. And so the bigger or denser things are going to travel more quickly um, because they kind of like feel that hole more. And so they're going to be further down in the gradient. And this can be used for things like purification, um, separating various 
various molecules and seasonal water classes experiments like vessels that install with during the seasonal core gradient to show that DNA replication is semi conservative, which means that one strand is used as a template for making the other strand, and then the new strand and the old strand stay together, and then they split and do this over and over. Um, so, more on that in other post on the same soils experiment. And you can also do gradients for things like purifying ribosomes, um, purifying um, organelles, things like lysosomes, nuclei, various things. There's multiple uses for centrifuges. So how do we go about best using a centrifuge? First of all, you, if whatever you're doing, you want to make sure that your tubes are balanced. Or if you have an even number of tubes, you can just stick them across from one another. Often with these like micro centrifuges, they make things easier in that they have, if you have two samples, they have like lines. Um, if you have three samples, you can space them out um, evenly, or if you have some other multiple three or something like that, um, you can also make a mark if you have permission to make a mark um, so that you know where the, the three are, if that makes things easier. Then there are ones to ways to balance that look like they shouldn't balance, um, but they really do. So sometimes it's easier to make a blank um, to use a blank than to try to figure out exactly what scheme you need to use in order to balance things. But so say you have five samples, what you can do is you can, you just need to have combinations of things that, that balance. So you can have this three, we know that this three works and we know that two works. So if we stick this one next to here, we just need to have something across from it. So these three balance each other out and these two balance each other out. Um, and you can add additional samples as long as they're balancing each other out. So you can often get away without having to actually use a blank. The faster you're gonna spin, the more important this is. So if you're just dealing with a little pulse centrifuge, one of these like microfuges, we'll see we're going to set the speeds. Um, it has like one set speed. Basically you just close the lid and it starts. If it has a switch and it starts, and just does a little pulse, and this is helpful when you just want to draw some liquid down to the sides of the tubes, maybe when you're um, preparing samples and you want to load it onto the gel or something, you want to make sure all that liquid gets to the bottom. These micro features are super helpful. You want to make sure that they're balanced, but you don't need to be like super accurate about balancing. So as long as you basically have a tube on either side, it's going to be okay. You don't need to worry about actually like measuring out the, the volume of these tubes or weighing them. Um, but when you're dealing with like real centrifuges, especially when you're dealing with ultra centrifuges, you need to be really, really careful about your balancing. So to best balance these tubes, um, what I typically do is say you have some volume of cell lysate that you want to spin down, or some cell, cell yeah, that you want to spin down in the ultra centrifuge to spin. So you take cells, you break them open, you want to separate like the membrane bits and all of that from the from the protein and the, the soluble stuff that you, your protein's in that you want to purify. What I typically do is I kind of try, try to figure out how many tubes I'm going to need. So the variety of different tube sizes, especially with the ultra, you want to make sure that you're using the right tubes for um, tubes for the machine that you're using. Um, so you want to figure out what rotor you're going to be using, what size tubes that rotor uses, and then try to figure out um, how many tubes you'll need based on the sizes of this. Know that you are going to need some number of tubes that's going to like balance out. So you might think you would need the number, even numbers easiest, but you can also do things like three as long as you space out the tubes evenly around the rotor. Although sometimes it's easier just to do a blank tube rather than try to get three tubes to balance perfectly. If you balance two of them, then you can use the third and just make a blank that matches the third one. That could be easier. Typically what I do is I take, um, I start by just eyeballing it. So split, split your volume into separate tubes and stick it on a balance. Whatever you do, be careful. This is like the best holder for here. Um, sometimes like a styrofoam rack is really good. You wanna make sure your tube is not going to fall over because trust me, that happens and it's not fun. So what you wanna do is you'll fill it with one of your tubes and then you'll take another tube. Um, so eyeball it kind of like eye level, leave a little bit of, your, of excess liquid or if you have like extra buffer you can add or something like that so that you have something you can add a little bit to in order to make the volumes, the 
the masts match. So you take, so you have two tubes you want to bounce, take them, see which one's heavier. Um, if they're, make sure that they're pretty close. If they're really off, just try to like even them out as best as you can without like actually going in detail and measuring. Then take the heavier tube and stick that on and press the zero button so that you're balancing, like setting that as your zero. Take the other tube, so this is a lighter tube and drop wise, like with the transfer pipette or something like that. Add a little bit of that excess that you left over or that buffer um, to get it to the same to the same weight. When you're doing this, make sure that you're including the lids. Um, sometimes these lids can get a little different in weight, and so you want to make sure you're including those lids. When you're doing the, um, for especially for the ultra centrifuge, you want to make sure that they're really well balanced. For some of the other centrifuges, it's not as big of a deal, but you still want them to be balanced. But for this ultras, it's super duper critical. We'll get more into the detail of that specifics of working with ultras. So whenever you're spinning, you need to make sure that the centrifuge can take the speed that you want, the rotor can take the speed that you want, or the tubes can take the speed that you want. So in terms of the rotor, you'll often find the information on the top of like the lid of the rotor, and there'll be a number. That number is typically going to tell you the maximum RPM that you can spit it at. So for example, a 45 Ti is going to go up to 45,000 RPM. If you had something like a 70 PI, that would be able to go up to 70 RPM. Um, and then like 110, 110, and that sort of thing. You also need to make sure though that your centrifuge can go up to that and that your tubes can go up to that speed because sometimes the tubes, even if your centrifuge and your rotor can go that fast, the tubes would crack or burst. And we'll get more into how you can make sure that your tubes don't burst and how to build them and things. Even if you have tubes that can take the speed, you need to make sure that you're using correct adapters if you did. So for example, if you have a conical tube, you can't just stick it in one of these round bottoms, even if it seems like it would fit. You need some sort of adapter, and these adapters are going to have like a snug bottom that's going to hold it. When you're, when you're centrifuging, these things are getting really, really fast. Even with a not so fast one, the force that these tubes are going to be feeling is really, really big. And so we can talk about this force um, like in terms of the G-force, the relative centrifugal field, so relative in terms of gravity. So especially with like an ultra centrifuge, you can be getting up to like hundreds of thousands of times gravity and force on the very end of that tube, and so you don't want it to collapse, and so you need to make sure that you're using adapters as appropriate, um, and you don't want them to burst or and also make sure that you're using correct size adapters so that the tubes don't get stuck in there. Um, that happened to me once where the tube was, it wasn't quite the right adapter apparently, and so the tube kind of got stuck in there. When it comes to these rotors, especially like the ultrasound huge rotors, there's a bunch of information about them that you can get from the rotor name um, and like written on the rotor lids. Um, so if you see something like we talked about how the number is going to tell you about the maximum RPM. There's also like letters. So TI that's telling you this is made of titanium, which is like this really strong one that they make. If you see C, that's a carbon or that's a composite, um, fiber composite. If you see AC, that is an aluminum composite, um, aluminum fiber composite. And if you don't see a name, then it's um, going to be an aluminum alloy some aluminum mixed with some other uh, metals. And this is at least for the Beckman centrifuges. Um, if you see, so you see type here, this is telling you that it's a fixed angle. If you see like an SW or an S, something like that, um, that's going to tell you it's a swinging bucket. And you might think, well, why don't you just look at it? Well, if you're looking at a protocol or something and it's mentioning what rotor it used, then you would be able to know. So it's not like you're just being lazy and can't look at the centrifuge. <laughs> right in front of you and tell whether it's fixed angle or swinging bucket. Sometimes you'll see like a decimal, like a 70 or versus a 70.1. This is because there are multiple rotors who have the same rated speed, but have like different volume capacities. This could be either in terms of like how big the individual tubes it holds are or how many of those tubes it holds. Um, that's, yeah, so that's the basics of what you can learn from one of these rotors. In addition, so these rotor tu these tubes have different sizes. There are also adapters that can go into the, um, into this here, allow you to hold different size tubes.
speaking of that GeForce, you want to make sure that when you're setting a machine, you know whether you're setting it in terms of the RCF, well, I'm sorry, that force, or in terms of the RPM, the revolution per minute, how fast the rotor is spinning. So the force that's felt is going to depend on how fast that rotor is spinning, as well as how far the sample is from the, how far the end of the sample is from the rotor center, so this radial distance. The further away it is, the, fast, the more the force is going to be felt, and the faster the spinning, the more the force is going to be felt. This equation uh, relates the two, so you can see that it's squared, and so any change in the RPM is going to be magnified. Um, so small changes in RPM can lead to a bigger difference in the RCM, and this is going to be more even further magnified when the radius is greater. There are various tools that you can use to convert between RCF and RPM. So in addition to having this equation, you, um, you, so you need to know the radius and things. If you don't know it, you can use this online converter from Beckman. So Beckman makes a bunch of these centrifuges. They're kind of like the main one. It's making a lot of these rotors, especially the older centrifuge rotors. And they have an online converter that you can use to convert between different rotors. Um, and their RPM and RCFs and things like that. They're also more um, old school, conventional manual methods um, where you don't have to do any math. But these things called a nomogram where they have these line charts basically with your radius, your step relative centrifugal field, and the speed. And so you draw, you draw a line through the two that you know, and it'll take you to the value that you don't know. Um, whatever you, you're doing, just make sure that when you're setting the machine, it's actually on RCF. If you want trying to set RCF, then it's on G or, or sorry, it's on. So sometimes it's RCS if it's also labeled G. Also make sure that it's on that. Sometimes it'll it'll be in terms of like thousands. So if it's like 40, that'll be like 40,000 G, not 40. Um, and then you want to, if you want, you're doing a general RPM, then make sure RPM is set. This is basically just know, make sure that you're setting what you think that you're setting. With some of these centrifuges, you can only set RPM, which is what the centrifuge is able to control. They can't control the force directly because that's going to depend on the rotor as well. And so sometimes if your centrifuge knows which rotor you put in, so maybe you program it so that you like actually enter which rotor is in there, it's able to do that conversion for you. But if not, you won't have to do the conversion and then put it in, in terms of the RPM. Okay, speaking of setting your centrifuge, if you need it to cool off, often when we're doing these spins, we're doing it at like four degrees Celsius if we're trying to um, protect proteins and things. So these centrifuges can get pretty hot. I learned the hard way the other day that even the centrifuges that are cooling, sometimes if you go fast too fast, they can't keep up. And so your the rotor is actually going to heat up. So be careful about that. Maybe if you're using a centrifuge and you need to go at a fast speed, do a little test run to make sure it's okay. Um, if you want to cool down the centrifuge though before you run, there's often like a fast temp button um, on these micro centrifuges or the benchtop centrifuges. Be some sort of like fast temp button that you can use in order to cool it down. Um, when you are using a centrifuge that you're trying to cool it down, make sure that you're not leaving the lid open. And it's going to kind of try to keep cooling itself. And so it's, it's going to then like get condensation and ice and things on the inside as well as waste a bunch of energy. So make sure that the lid stays closed if you're trying to keep it cold. And if you're not, you can turn it off and leave the lid open so that um, condensate doesn't appear when you're using like the big, um, when the these like big centrifuges sometimes we like keep these open so that it doesn't get all um, condensy. But when you want to cool it, then you would close it and turn it on so that it cools down. Some of these centrifuges you can just chill. Um, they don't have like a fast temp button, but if you set the temperature when it's on, it'll cool down. Some of them like the ultra centrifuges, you might need to actually press the vacuum button in order to get it to cool down and then wait until it's cooled down in order to start it. So when you're starting to run, you want to make sure, like, don't just like start it and walk right away. It's going to take a minute to get to speed, especially depending on how fast you want to go. For the ultras, this is going to be an even bigger issue because it's going to have to like start the vacuum and things like that. But in terms of these, whatever these centrifuges, you want to make sure it gets up to speed, or at least it starts to get up to speed for the ultra. We'll get more into that um, without an imbalance error. So often when you're starting a centrifuge, there's going to be like an initial, it'll kind of start kind of slow, but the initial part was kind of like vibrating. This is 
not necessarily that your samples are unbalanced. The centrifuge kind of has this like stage that it goes through where it's like the most, the hardest for it. Um, and so it's going to kind of like shake in things and then it'll even out once it gets higher up. But you want to make sure that it gets past that kind of shaky point. Um, so it'll kind of, you'll see if you're watching the RPM, it'll kind of stall out and they'll stay there and you're like, is this ever gonna get up to speed? And it'll be forever and just like waiting around and then it'll start ramping up really quick. So make sure it gets past that initial, like initial hard spot for it. Um, sometimes if it can't get through, if it's like in balance, then it'll give you an error and it'll stop and you don't want that to happen. And then you'd, you'd walk away and you come back and you think your sample's gone, but really it had an imbalance error. So stick around and make sure that there's no error. Um, keep it clean. So this is, you're not, Typically, this is not your centrifuge. Like this is the lab centrifuge. Sometimes you're sharing with multiple labs. You want to make sure that you are inspecting it. These are really, really expensive pieces of equipment. Um, you don't want there to be spills in there. If there are spills, clean it up. Um, be a good lab mate. Okay, so speaking of expensive, ultra centrifuges are really, really, really expensive. So you want to make sure you're really, 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 really careful with these. Um, one thing that you need to do is you need to be careful about how full you're filling the tubes. So there are different types of tubes depending on the different types of centrifuges. They have different wall thicknesses and sometimes this is going to come into play. Some of these have lids, some of these don't have lids depending on the applications and the rotor types. With various rotor um, tubes and types, there are different fill limits, um, both the minimum and the maximum fills. When it comes to these, 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 these tubes that we use just for typical pelleting and things like this, um, such as when after you broke open cells and now you're trying to separate out that lysate, uh, like the, you're separate, clarify the lysate, and so get rid of the soluble stuff, the insoluble gunk. With these tubes, you want to make sure that they're at least halfway full, but you don't want to overfill them. And so to prevent that, to check if they're going to be overfilled, what you can do is you can kind of hold them at the angle they're going to be held at the, in the centrifuge and make sure that the liquid's not going to come into contact with that O-ring, which that can cause it to leak and then damage the vacuum seal. So speaking of these O-rings, there's going to be multiple O-rings. Um, so both on the rotor lid, top and the bottom, as well as in the rotor tube lids. So you want to make sure that all of these have the O-rings and that the O-rings are firmly in here and that they're not all dried out. So you want to keep like silicon vacuum grease. You can just take, well, swipe your finger and swipe around to make sure that this stays greased and stays, um, stays in place. Sometimes if you open up the ultra centrifuge and you'll see like a black line around the inside, that's often because one of these has snapped um, and then that black thing like kind of flipped around and stay in the inside. Okay, so you want to make sure that everything is is tightened. Um, you can actually use like a these often have this like hole in this lid that you can use like a screwdriver to help tighten it, but don't over tighten it so that you can't get it off. Um, but make sure it's tight, um, and then you can also use the screwdriver to help get the tubes out after, or like a pen or some sort of thing. It's kind of hard to get the tubes out sometimes. Um, same thing about wanting to pull off the rotor. Um, so. Or, so typically what we do is we keep the rotors cold and then we don't have to worry as much about getting an ultra centrifuge cold. So you can keep the rotors just in like a deli fridge often. Um, you can see that they have rotors in a bunch of different sizes. These rotors are often like fluted so they have these like chiseled out portions in between the different buckets because it can get really heavy and we'll talk more about some of the different metals and types in a minute. Um, as I was mentioned before, some of these centrifuges, you actually have to, this one's really nice because it's all automated and things. Um, with some of them, you actually have to do things a little more manually. You can cool down centrifuges often by actually to have like a vacuum button. So you can actually set this vacuum button and it'll start cooling down. Um, and then you want to stop that right before you're actually going to put your samples in because it'll start heating up really quickly beforehand as well. Um, okay, so, and again, you really wanna make sure that it's getting past that initial hurdle stage when it's starting up. And then it's going to take a long time in order to get up to speed probably. So you want to check back in a few minutes to make sure it's getting up to speed. So part of the reason why it's gonna take so much to get up to speed with these ultra centrifuges is because it has to establish like a vacuum seal. 
before it can get up really fast. And so it'll often show you the vacuum. Um, so here, it's like right here. And you'll see this number start to go down, go down. When you're dealing with one of the older centrifuges, often you'll have to wait for the vacuum to go down before you actually start the run spinning. And so it'll go down, like flash like 200 for a long time. And then finally it'll flash like under 20 and then when it's under 20, you can start the run. And so you should be, whenever you're using an ultrasound feature for the first time, you should be having someone that's used before training you on it to make sure that you know the details about that particular centrifuge that you're using. Um, but once the vacuum goes, then you can start the spinning or with something like this, it'll do it for you. And so it'll kind of like um, stop out around 3000 and tell the establishes this vacuum and then gets up to speed. And once it typically establishes that vacuum and starts getting up to speed, then typically things go okay for the run. Um, know that it may spin fast, so but it starts and stops slowly. You can also, there's like options to set the acceleration and deceleration rates. So it can be good to have a slow deceleration if you're doing something like gradient where you want to make sure that you're not disrupting the difference from bands or if you have a sensitive pellet that maybe isn't strongly pelleted you want to make sure that it doesn't unpellet you can set the deceleration to slow but if you don't want to set the deceleration to slow make sure that the deceleration is not slow because that's not a fun um that's not a fun um surprise when you come and it's taking forever to stop again keep it keep it clean this is especially important for these ultra centrifuges you have to keep that vacuum um, if you have spills, this is going to prevent the vacuum from forming, and so it'll going to take even longer to start, and it can mess up the centrifuge. Um, and then the centrifuge, like technician, basically lives in your lab, which is has happened before. Well, not live in the lab, but they they can be there a lot because this can keep happening if the centrifuges aren't properly cared for. There's also typically a logbook with the ultra centrifuges, um, sometimes with the normal centrifuges as well, so that you can keep track of how much it's being used, and this is going to help with the like routine maintenance and things like that, as well as noting when there are any errors and problems. Also, if you want to change the time for a run, or if you need to change the time for a run, say your rotor may maybe doesn't go up to the same speed, you know, so you can't go up as high, so you need to spin it longer in order to get the same amount of separation, you can use this basic equation where you multiply the first RCF by the first time, so this would be like your initial protocol that you're trying to copy, and then you could figure out what, if you can know that you want to go at a certain, um, certain speed or a certain force, and then your time, um, and figure out what time, or if you know you need to go for a certain time, so maybe you have a meeting, and so you don't wouldn't be able to get back in time if you do it at your normal speed, or maybe you need to do some sort of overnight spin and you want to make sure you have enough time to get some sleep, then you can alter the time and figure out what you need to change the RCF to. So that's like a quick estimate going with the RCF and the, the time. If getting a little more complicated, it also depends on the path length. And so there's this thing called the K factor, which takes into account that path length as well as the, um, the G force to give you this measure of like sedimenting efficiency. So if you think about what it takes, the molecule has to go from the minimum radius to the maximum radius to hit the wall um, and pellet it out. And so that distance is the sedimentation distance, this R max minus R min. And depending on how long it is, it's going to affect how long it takes to pellet something out. So this K factor takes into account that length as well as how the force that it's feeling. So if you have a longer path length, it's going to um, take longer to pellet, it's going to be harder to pellet something basically, or it'll take longer. So this K factor is taking that into account to give you an idea of how fast it'll be to sediment a very a particle of a certain size. Um, and so this K factor you can use to compare between um, centrifuge runs and different centrifuges and rotors in order to try to adapt protocols to um, or, or, or to figure out how long you need to spin something for or what speed you need to spin something for in order to pellet out a particular particle. And so because the pelleting is going to depend on the size and mass of the particle, 
um, this K factor then gets multiplied by like the sedimentation coefficient of that particle. So some point it might be like Spellberg units and like S something something S. Um, and so basically this this K factor is going to how much long it act, is going to tell you about the the pelleting power of the centrifuge and of that combination of the G-force and that rotor. And then to figure out how much a certain particle would take to pellet, um, then you have to like multiply it by the sedimentation coefficient and stuff. But if you're just trying to compare between centrifuges, then you can use this equation similarly to how we saw before, except here we're using K instead of the RCF. So we're taking into account um, the, that distance. Um, and yes, so here you can see that they're taking into account, they're like calculating the RCF based on this too as well, um, by, by, but based on the RPM. And um, that's why you don't see the RCF directly in this equation. Um, but that's the basics with this K thing, but typically you, and you can find like charts of it and information about the K, um, the K factor for various rotors, um, but, it's like if you go to the centrifuge configuration thing here too, you can do protocol transfers. You can, um, what you can do though, if you want to just like adapt the run, what you can do is you can select the rotor. Um, so say you want to fix the angle, you want like a 45, that 45 TI, TI 45. Or type 45 TI. And now if you go to calculate, it'll tell you like, you can put in one of these things and it'll give you all these. And it also includes the K factor here. Um, so you can see the efficiency of separation, which incorporates path length and G-force. And so say you have some sort of speed run and you want to then convert it, you can choose a, um, a second centrifuge and then convert between the two. And so this is a really helpful tool. So maybe you now want to use a different tube size. Maybe you want to use the 70. And now you can calculate um, and you can do things like into the runtime. Um, so if I want to do a 60 minute run, what would I need to do in this one? And so it's defaulting to using the maximum RPM, but you could change it here if you wanted a different RPM. Um, but you can see that the K factor is going to be lower here, which means that it's going to sediment faster because these tubes are going to be smaller. It's going to have a smaller distance. Okay, but this one will have allow you to hold a greater volume. And so you get you get that, um, you just don't um, get quite as fast of the speed um, for the sedimenting. Beckman has this really great centrifuge primer, which um, I found really helpful and I will post a link to, and hopefully it'll help you too. Um, so yeah, so just be careful with your centrifuges and then you can do lots of really, really cool things with them. And hope that this helped you understand how to best use them and best of luck with your experience.